kingdom. Welcome to the first event, not just of term, but of the year at the Cambridge Union. It's so great to see new faces. I hope you all come to this event and come back on Thursday and become regular attenders of the Union. It's a great place. Um, I couldn't be more grateful to be joined by Theo Bafritas for our first event of term. Um, Theo has a business empire that spans retail, property, and finance. He left school at 16 with no qualification due to his dyslexia, but soon discovered a passion for retail working for Watches Switzerland, and the rest is history. I think we all know Theo best for his experience as uh, TV's Dragon, uh, Dragon on Dragon's Den, and that's something that I'm really keen to talk about today because I must admit I'm a huge fan of the show. Um, this is your society, so I'm going to do a few questions to start Theo off, but I won't talk for too long, and I'm going to hand over to you because so many of you have so many questions for Theo. But Theo, um, as I said, I'm keen to get onto Dragon's Den. I think it's fascinating, but they don't choose dragons for nothing, and you've had this incredible practical business career for so long. If you had to choose one thing, what are you most proud of? Wow. Well, obviously, it'd be in the warm-up act for this year's um, <laughs> student union. But this is the first, is it? This is our first event, yeah. Fantastic. And everybody found their way here? <laughs> the cream of the crop. Well done. Um, listen, I, I think in, when you get on in life, as I have, and, and really reaching the end of my career, more as you guys are at the start of your career, and I remember other people saying that to me and flippantly ignoring what they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, actually, it's so exciting to be at the start of your career. When you come to the end of your career, you have done so many things, and I can't say I've done anything I'm not proud of, but I've done things I'd wish I hadn't. I've screwed up, and, you know, as you screw up, as you get on with your career, you take it harsh on the way but it, you achieve lots of other things as well so what you learn as you go in your career you'll never be able to answer that question <laughs> because from a business perspective a career perspective not from a personal because you will go on you'll find someone you fall in love with and you, you know you partner up and some of you will have children and everything else and those are wonderful things that we're all proud of that we lead on this earth. And people that we would 
feel that we might give our life for in circumstances. Um, but from a working career, it's never one silver bullet. There'll be lots and lots and lots of little things. So my answer to that is don't underestimate the little things because it's lots of little things that you might not realize at the time that are going to make the difference to what happens afterwards. And that's why I can't give a binary black and white answer to that question. It's a great question, but it hasn't in my life and in my career hasn't got a binary answer that I can just flippantly throw to you. I've done lots of things. I've made a lot of money. I've lost money. I've made money. Uh, I've achieved things in business. Um, I've seen things that other people hadn't seen and managed to capitalize on it. And lots of things that I'm proud of. But it w there wasn't, there's not one thing that says that was it. That was a holy grail. That was what really... Um, reflects me. So you mentioned those screw-ups. I'm quite interested in that because I think Cambridge is full of perfectionists and people that are terrified of making mistakes. Do you think those mistakes were important? Or do you think they helped you get where you are or you just regret them, wish you could take them back? Okay. It, it's fortuitous you said that because we, we talked about a little bit earlier about it. So I've done a, um, a blog on LinkedIn only uh, this Monday. So if any of you are on LinkedIn, uh, have a look. And it is about screwing up. It's not about all my successes. It's about my screw-ups and why they happen and what I learn about myself when that happens and how those screw-ups can be a step to success and how those screw-ups were a step to success. Although I've got to be honest, I never felt so at the time. It's not often you can go home to your wife and children in you know, your forever house that you had built with more toilets and bucket and pallets, indoor swimming pools, the whole works at a tender age. And while she's making the kids tea, just say to her, the house has got to go. And the reason is because we own it, we own it jointly with the bank and they'd like it back. <laughs> um, small technical points. <laughs> happened. She carried on cooking, on cooking for the kids and said, right, okay, and carried on cooking. Um, and, you know, that night when we went to bed, she said, did you really mean what you said? I said, oh, you did hear it then. <laughs> she said, God, she said, to be frank, she said, in those days when you moved, it wasn't cardboard, board, but we had tea chests. She said, there's about eight tea chests in the garage. I haven't even unpacked them since we moved in. We can just move them as they are. And so these things happen in your life and you think the world's come to an end. You've gone from hero to zero. I think, shit. But I can't tell you how defining that moment and that experience was. It was bloody painful and hurt, not physically, obviously. Um, hurt so much at the time. But it was very, very defining as to my character and how I would etch out my career again and what would happen and how I would do it. Because I would not make the same mistake twice or a series of mistakes twice. And it must be incredible to have that support network and to, to know you could throw something so massive at someone and your wife could say, oh, we've got the tea chest, we can move. Do you think that's part of what helped you sort of rebuild things the second time? I think that's right. It, it, it's, and it, it's funny, but we all take great credit for um, our successes and the things that we achieve. But it's, yes, it's you. But don't take for granted the support mechanisms that we all enjoy. Um, the, the pure privilege of being at this university is one. 
I know you all realize that you're one of the greatest, you're at one of the greatest universities in the world. But do you really realize is your answer? What was the drive? You, you won't really realize till much later in your careers that what support mechanisms have a, got you to get to where you are today. Well, I think sometimes we've just got to take a, a breath, stop, and look around us and appreciate the support mechanisms that we've been for, we're fortunate to have, whether it's from our parents, our spouses, partners, friends, relatives. There is always something that helps you with that. And yes, for me, it was, it was important that it wasn't a negative reaction. Mm. I mean, she didn't do a flip dance and say, great, fantastic, cheers. <laughs> You know, you've made my day. I mean, it was a bit of a, in the morning, when we're going to tell the kids, because will they have to leave school? You know, you know, these are all the things you then start thinking about. Is that going to happen? You know, we now pull them out of, and we're fortunate, I've sent my kids to a, a, a private school, but uh, are these things going to happen? And my attitude was, and, and certainly hers was, well, we didn't go to a private school. So they're going to have to do without private schooling, aren't they? I guess if, if you did so well off the back of it, there must be that reassurance that... Yeah, so you feel confidence that it's, it's not going to be the end of the world. I'm curious you brought up school um, and on this track of talking about adversity. Um, your story is really fascinating because obviously you left school at 16 without qualifications, having struggled with dyslexia. Can you talk about how, about you, how you overcame that and how you got to where you are from what must have been quite a difficult start? Um, it could take a very long time, but yeah, at school, uh, I was thicko. <laughs> I was absolutely thicko, not Theo. So, but it's strange, because you move from junior school to senior school, so at the age of 11, for those uh, international students, at the age of 11, you move to a senior school in a state sector. Um, so at junior school, you're just in one class with all your mates of mixed ability, and you become friends, and you play football, you play rugby, you play cricket, you do all the things that you do with, 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 with your mates. Then, shock, you go to senior school, you, go, you, just, you find out you're going, you're going to senior school with those four or five mates, the other four go into a different caption, uh, caption area, and oh, well, fantastic, they're close friends, so I'm going to the same senior school as my friends. And then, very quickly, you realize, actually, you've gone to the same school, but they're in a different class. And actually, not are they also in a different class, but they're afforded certain other advantages. You, on the other hand, are in a different stream. There would be four streams, and my friends were in the first stream, and I would be in the fourth stream. And you did different subjects, you did same subjects, but terribly different levels. And you were doing different things. And the minute the, minute the penny drops, that actually you're in that fourth stream because of your lack of ability. which you never, never realized. I never even thought about. And the fact that you could have friends who are in the first stream, I never struggled to communicate with them, enjoy the things that kids do together. And there was never any issue, intellectually. Mm -hmm. Because the dyslexia, which wasn't known then, because there was no such thing, you were just thick. You weren't intelligent and you were treated accordingly. And that, that, was, that, that, was, that was a tough one. And that was tough till um, the age of 13, 14, when a, a particular teacher managed, who, who it was actually the, the housemaster, because the teacher that was taking the class, geography, um, was off ill. And, the rowdy, the rowdy class I was in, that had no intention of learning anything. I mean, we 
cause havoc and of course sadly I just joined in um, and by joining in I was a bit brighter as they say so I became a bit of a ringleader um, so causing havoc was a pastime wouldn't make life easy for anybody why because no one making life easy for me why should I um, and deputy head teacher came took took that class and he was an ex naval chap and asked loads of questions and he was talking about the navy and everything else and I actually engaged with him and at the end of the class he asked to see me and I thought I was going to be told off and he sat me down for an hour and just talked to me about various things and then the penny dropped with him that actually I'm in the wrong class so apart from being a difficult child the reason I was a difficult child um, I was the result of the circumstances that they put me in mm. and the rest of the time, and then he, he actually uh, sponsored me to move up to different classes be more challenged um, you're gonna hate this when I tell you I became uh, chairman of the union the student union <laughs> um, started the student tuck shop we couldn't have a bar in those days we were too young um, and got involved quite heavily in those areas so I uh, managed to get let steam out that way. Do you ever think how different things could be without that one teacher? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because at least he encouraged me through to the age of 16 to do things within the school that weren't academic, academically biased, but were learnings and would be handy to have going forward. And starting the tuck shop, he subbed me 25 quid from the school fund to start that. And trusted me to do it. And trusted me to overcome any problems and get it going. I never knew that you started in business with a, with a school tuck shop. Yeah, the school fund. See, I, I, I said that Watch the Switzerland, your first ever business, but clearly it was, it was at the school tuck shop. That's... And I think it's interesting, you're talking about your kids and moving them from a private school to a state school and your experiences. Do you think we get schooling wrong? Let me, let me just put you straight there. Well, that the was threat. The yeah, never, no, we actually course. managed not to <laughs> but That was what could have been the having things that you to, worry about. And things. Having to think about that. Yeah. Do you think we get schooling wrong? And do you think we still, still fail kids like you if they don't have an inspirational teacher? Or do you think that's changed? I, I think there's a lot of change. I mean, who hasn't heard of dyslexia here? Everyone's heard of it. There was no such word. You were just thick. So there's a lot of help now, a lot of understanding, a lot of opportunities. So I've got various commitments coming up um, over the next uh, few weeks and few months, um, which I need to be briefed on. And Emily is sitting in the front with my assistant. Um, we're in the car all the way here. And she reads to me. So she was reading my brief. She had to hand me a piece of paper. So you, you skip out the sort of, you're able to overcome very quickly. Right, so you can adapt. We're brilliant at adapting. Humanity is fantastic. That's how we got here in the first place, remember? So we can adapt as we go along. Whatever, whatever issues that we come across, um, we adapt. And I, dyslexia now, I, I actually treat it as one of my superpowers. Because it helped me adapt. At the time, I found I had to solve problems. I was bright, just could not deal with academia. So I had to find ways of dealing with it. So I found I would work around everything. I would find workarounds, which is a marvellous thing when you go to work. Because you'd be surprised how many crap people are out there doing jobs at a high level. And yes, you're going to meet them all. <laughs> Make sure you're not one of them. They can work out the square root of a jar of whelks but can't get the lid off to eat the bloody jar, the, the <laughs> whelks. And you wonder how. So that was, that, so I find that as an advantage. And then moving forward a bit, um, I'm really keen to get on to Dragon's Den. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, you pulled him straight away. I mean, I'm just running away. Yeah. No, we were just here for the, the early life stuff. Um, <laughs> When you read about Dragon's Den, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors about the show. And if we look... Is there? I feel... 
we only see the bit that gets filmed. Um, and that's what I'm quite Kinjowski about, because what we see is someone come in and give you an elevator pitch of what they're doing, and you make a snap decision. Is that really what happens, or do you know a bit more? Right, so Dragon's Den has changed. has changed a lot over the years. So I did it for nine years. Um, and when it first started, you actually, they, you would do maybe four pitches in a filming eight-hour day, sometimes nine-hour day. So you have to sit there, listen to someone droning on. And honestly, if they put all the facial expressions on screen, no one would ever watch the show. And you'd be shuffling from butter to butter to butter. And you'd be asking them questions and everything else. And it would take hours. Um, and eventually there'd be an investment or not an investment. And that one hour, two hours, you might see six, seven minutes of, or just a montage of 30 seconds. Mm. So there's a lot goes on that you don't actually see. And of course, there is also the magic of television, as we found out later in Dragon's Den, where they simplified everything. Um, but certainly the, the early, early years were long pitches. You would see six, seven minutes. They might have gone on for hours. And then you may say, why did they invest in that? If it wasn't cut properly. Or why didn't they invest in that? Mm. If it wasn't cut properly. So you don't see the background all the time. But you saw more of it at the beginning. Now it's a little bit faster pitch now. It's a lot quicker. Um, pitch, and they show every pitch. Whereas before, you, uh, you went into three categories. You never got shown at all. You were part of a montage, which would show 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And you'd be one of the main pitches in the show. Whereas now they show every single pitch because the dragon's end format is loved by so many i think as testament by the fact that across the pond we've got sort of shark tank doing a very american version of it um but they've been revealed as the pitch as being a very small part of the process and the fact there's sort of lots of stages after but is dragon's den really you decide in the pitch what happened dragon's den was the first yeah obviously does anybody know how dragon's den started no okay so, it started one series in Japan. It's a shocker. I did not know that. It was like a prize show with gold lame jackets and everything. Proper shocker. It wasn't like, the, nothing like the Dragon's Den is. Lots of lights, people wearing bright clothes, running around. I mean, it was just like horror. Um, and it was owned by Sony. And the BBC agreed to make a version here. Took one look at it and thought, concept's good, but this is shocking. And Dragon's Den, as you understand it now, with the chairs in the warehouse and everything else, was a BBC change. And BBC still pay a royalty to Sony. And Sony get a royalty from every country, which copies the BBC. Apart from America, who called it Shark's Tank, but still pays Sony a royalty. <laughs> right? um, and the reason it's set in a warehouse, because that's where it was set. So every, uh, and we did it in a warehouse for about five years, but it became very expensive because there was road noise. And every, if you're in the middle of a pitch, and fire engines, police engines, trains would go by, car, the train went, I mean, it would take, take forever to get a pitch done. Mm. So in the end, they duplicated the, and replicated the warehouse in, in Palmwood Studios, next door to the James Bond site. You imagine for us, it was bloody marvellous. You go from a dusty old shitty warehouse, and all of a sudden you're at Pinewood, and you go into the canteen at Pinewood, and there'll be every famous actor, Johnny Depp, who I remember uh, Deborah Meaden, who's a tough old girl, um, melt and start losing the ability to talk like a human being. <laughs> and he was doing some Dracula movies, so he was still covered in all the makeup, white makeup, his hands and face. And she took his hand. 
shake hands like the rest of us did. And she never let go. And then she took her other hand and put it on his wrist. She's doing that. It was, it was hilarious. And then she got white powder on her face, white all over her hands. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it was marvellous. But that, then we replicated that studio at Pinewood. Yeah. Which was a lot quicker, a lot sharper. And we were in the same set, actually, that did all, well, you wouldn't know, all the 60s carry-on films. <laughs> and when you're watching those black and white films, I'll see all, because they never bother with sets, they just use the studio. It's hilarious. <laughs> you recognise every part of it. God, look out for those. Um, I've got one final question, or sort of two-part question, and then I want to hand it to the audience, because I think they're probably raring to go. But something that I've always really admired you for is you've been quite politically vocal. And the first time I became aware of that really was the Brexit referendum. And you wrote a series of really fascinating blogs on being a reluctant lever. What's your view of Brexit now, having seen the last few years? I think my view is very simple. It can be defined by the governments we've had, which has been a shit show. <laughs> we have really, I mean, if you read my blogs, um, the final one was written two or three days, after, three days after the referendum. And I was honest about the way I voted, why I voted. Sorry, I thought I probably wrote a blog the week beforehand saying where I was going to vote, only a few, a few days beforehand. So I didn't want to influence anybody. Mm. And then I wrote a blog three or four days afterwards about how I felt about the whole issue. Um, and I made it clear that I was apprehensive, I was nervous, nervously excited, really. And whether it's the great British public voted correctly or otherwise would depend on the skill of our elected politicians. Mm. And let's be honest, who have we had since? I mean, those of you, how many international students here? Yeah, you see, you got off lightly. You haven't <laughs> seen how much crap there's been in Parliament <laughs> since then. I mean, we have had calamity after calamity of politicians sitting in the chair <laughs> and making decisions on the future of my future and my children. And it's such a wasted opportunity. So fast forward a few years, this is my final question. We've got Liz Truss in Parliament, um, and we've got one of the most extreme uh, sort of fiscal approaches to the economy. You're a businessman. What is, what is your view of that? What do you think the UK is now like for businesses? Uh, well, I think her approach, I don't know Liz Truss, I'm, um, obviously I heard some of the things that she said as she was going around the country trying to win the Tory leadership campaign. Um, but her and Kwasi, Kamikaze, <laughs> he's an ex-Cambridge boy, be careful. Um, there's, there's loads of crap Oxford people as well, so don't worry. Um, I, I just, it just, they gone full time to nuts. I mean, it was just like, they beat the, look, we've been elected. <laughs> oh, abolish everything, give all the sweeties out, that's it. I mean, it's nuts. It's like they've just got the keys to the sweet shop, invite all their mates in, and said, let's have it. I mean, how, why, who? Oh, no, sorry, no. They went and fired everybody that had half a brain I always experienced. And then said, if you're not a lawless, don't, don't do as we say, you can't be in the cabinet. So anybody who's competent, bugger off, and we're going to put all our mates in, and all our mates are going to come in, and they've got no experience, or very little experience, but it doesn't matter because they're our mates. <laughs> and they're going to do whatever we tell them. And the fact we haven't got a clue means there's no checks and balances. No one's going to say, oi, just, 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 do you know we think that one? Because if you do that, anybody knows this is what's going to happen afterwards. Mm. I mean, it was, it was just an amazing situation we just lived through. That's never happened. We've gone from a hard currency where people respected our economy and the fact that our politics and our economy had loads of checks and balances and nothing silly was going to happen. So people were happy to invest in the pound because, you know, the good old British conservative values would always be there to go to Kamikaze. And we became a tin pot, tin pot republic where a currency was worth 
nothing. <laughs> Nobody would put any money because somebody's going to go and borrow lots and lots of money, billions and billions of pounds, and guess what they were going to do with it? They were going to give it to the rich. <laughs> yep, what a brilliant idea. Run up the national debt and give billions of pounds to the rich. So when they're leaving their central London clubs after a really good night on the port, they can drop a fiver to the doorman who can go and feed his children and maybe spend it and we can have trickle-down economics. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those of you studying economics, you're going to enjoy studying this in the future. <laughs> totally barking nuts. And of course, everything that we said would happen has happened. You know, she, she's had to do a U-turn, he's had to do a U-turn. Um, whether they can survive it, anything's possible in politics, I suppose, but I mean, parking, I mean, it's just no, unprecedented. No, it really is. It's unprecedented. Lucky it hasn't lasted too long and he's going to do his LBR statement before the end of the month. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they're going to be asking, going to say, well, the rest of it makes sort of near sense. If it doesn't make near sense, just watch the pound slide even lower, but then how's he going to make the numbers meet? How's he going to balance the books? We've spent a huge amount of money on power uh, subsidies. Unnecessary, but there's a war. It's unprecedented times. It should be a force majeure. There's other ways of raising money. That's really fascinating to hear from, from a businessman and someone that I guess one of the few people that would have benefited. We've got a debate on Thursday. This House has no confidence in the emergency government. We should have had you oh, come sorry, to that. That's a great one. I'm, are, you brought, are you streaming it? We are, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Who's, there, who's on it? Um, we've got the Mayor for Cambridge, which is quite exciting, um, and the MP for Hitchin and Harpenden, and then we'll be auditioning student speakers to come. Who's the MP for Hitchin and Harpenden? Uh, Birma Falami. So he's going to speak for the Conservatives. But I'll send, I'll send Emily or Lucas. Oh, lovely. Good. Lovely to have you. Have you watched that? But on that note, I'm going to hand over to the audience. I imagine I have a lot of burning questions. Uh, so anyone with a question for Theo, please pop your hand up. Um, and we'll go Max in the front first. We've got one brave soul. <laughs> uh, thank you, Theo, for coming for the first event of the year. Um, so I want to sort of switch to football. You became, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, you became chairman of Millwall back in the 90s. And I'm a Fulham fan. And like Craven Cottage is like known as like a very like child friendly middle class place versus like the den of Millwall, which is like got a history of hooliganism, got a history of like nasty stuff. How difficult was it taking over Millwall? And can you just tell us a bit about your time there? Well, obviously it was great because you know as you go there you can see them ripping the, the arms and legs of small children, throwing them to the dogs, you know emasculating each other. I mean, it's, fab it's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, you've been reading history books again, haven't you? The wrong ones. Um, no, it, it, Millwall was always very passionate. It was a dockers club. So it's very, very South London. Um, demographics, you can work out. There's people working on the docks. So the salt of the earth, look after their own, you know, stand up for each other. And it's a very, very passionate club. And they got a reputation many years before me that meant that every time they sneezed, the media would make it into an earthquake. The same thing would happen at a Premier League club. We never read it in the press. So uh, I think the answer is there are no angels, but they're nowhere near as, ba uh, as bad as the reputation that's been reported by Her Majesty's Press. We'll go to the front there. Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask if, like, I'm sure in your many years at uh, Dragon's Den, you've seen a lot of pitches. If there are any pitches you regret not taking or not investing? The answer is, this is a binary answer because it's a principled answer. And sometimes when you've got principled answers, a bit of Liz Trust, you don't think the rest of it through. <laughs> I'm not sure she knows what she is, is she? Where is she? Wherever she is today, wherever she is. <laughs> um, which is Tory leader, of course. Um, no, because if I wanted something, I could get it. And if there was something that I wanted, I would always get it. 
because it's just a matter of price if you really want something. So there's no regrets because my views, if I really want it, oh, I want to work. I mean, there's some great things came in at then that were good, were good inventions, good, good business plans. But I didn't like the people. And I don't want to work with someone I don't like. So I couldn't be asked. <laughs> and, that's, and life is like that. So I was a fortunate position. I could take the view. I can't be asked. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make an offer. And there was other th people that came in that I really liked. And their, their idea and their business plan was incredibly average. I said, I don't care because I can work with them. And I can work with them to make that average idea a money-making idea. And lastly, not all ideas are money-making ideas, however brilliant they are. You spend a lot of money on something that's a good idea, but it won't make any money. So, no, I was quite clear after the first series about how I was going to invest and who I was going to invest in. That doesn't mean I got it right all the time, by the way. We'll just go to the back there in the black pillow tote. Yeah, you made a lot of money in the high street, uh, Ryman, Robert Dias. How do you see now as e-commerce takes more and more of a market share, in particular Amazon, um, changing that landscape? And what are you doing in particular with your businesses to combat that? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. Uh, so all our businesses have got an online presence, and Robert Dias, 50% of his business is online. Blue Avenues is 50% of his business is online. So we've embraced online. But... You know, online is not the big money owner. So we all saw all the online players spike in value during COVID. And we had huge flotations, uh, businesses floating for billions and, of pounds and hundreds of millions of pounds because uh, people got carried away investing in them because they did really well during COVID. Well, the high street has taken a lot of that business back. And then if you look at the valuation of those businesses, those businesses floated, floated for 600 million and now valued at 20 million. Businesses that floated for billions, 6 billion, are valued 500 million. So you've seen a huge decrease because just because you're online doesn't mean you're going to make money. It's expensive being online. Historically, we had a huge unfair uh, rental system and rate system. We still have an unfair rent rate system, but rentals have been a lot more sensible. And also the cost of doing business online has gone up as a competition. So actually the cost of buying, of earning a pound online and the cost of earning a pound in the high street, whereas before COVID, cost of earning a pound online say, was here and the cost of earning a pound was here in the high street because you had to pay rent and rates and taxes that you don't pay online. Since COVID, that has pretty well rebalanced. So there's, we're still opening stores. Um, and when you talk about some of the online players, my only gripe is the online players that don't pay tax. And the inability of politicians, and I've given Paul Liz, she's got some good points, you know, um, but, but it's not just her. The inability of politicians prior trust Johnson, Cameron, May, the lack of boldness. Or, no, it's not even bold. You have to be bold. It's just common sense. It's pretty well cowardly not to address the issue. When this country needs income, we've got to run our services. Police, NHS, which they all like to nail their flag to. Ambulance service fire service, social welfare, all that's going to be paid. Why would you allow companies coming from other, com other countries doing business here, taking tens, if not hundreds of billions of pounds out of our economy and not contributing their fair share of tax? Mm. Can anyone give me an answer to that? Because I haven't found a politician that can. Because they run for cover the minute I bring it up. And they won't even return your calls afterwards. 
because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to deal with the difficult things. I'm always been brave for Quasi and uh, Trust to uh, uh, do on that first budget. I would have helped the pound. I would have helped them because lower borrowings for the government, the pound would be more valuable, interest rates stay down. So you know what? We need, I need, we got, we need 100, 150 billion to pay for subsidizing fuel and power. It's gotta come from somewhere. We've got these companies making all this money not paying any tax. We're gonna tax them. Why do you get so unpopular as a policy? Oh, you tell me. So why is it unpopular to put a windfall tax on? So when you're a power or, or, or an energy company, you do your budgets at the beginning of the year, your business plan, and whether you're an oil company, gas company, that I'm talking mainly about, I might just mainly clarify that. If you're an oil company or gas company, you do your budgets, and you think you're going to get X per unit of the power you sell, and you're happy, and you're going to make a profit, and you're going to pay up dividends. When there is an unprecedented event, a force majeure, a war, which then gives you the ability to make five to ten times that, it really is not unreasonable for the country that you're based in to say, this is force majeure, this is unprecedented, you know what, what's been the average profits you've made for the last five years will double that and everything else you give back to the people. Mm. You're, not, you're still going to do well. Yeah. Because I think it's a lot of people have been calling for that, um, but the government have refused to do it, which I found quite interesting. Well, yeah. This present government refused to do it. Previous governments have done it. That's very true. So that's... that's some weird things going on in our economy that are simple, that politicians won't deal with because they're too difficult, doesn't suit their political part, party purpose for that moment in time, or have had a vested interest of some form, or an affinity. I'm not suggesting they're corrupt, by the way, that's not. We're, we've probably got one of the cleanest political systems in the world. I'm not saying it's perfect, though. Still things that shouldn't be happening. So... You know, there's, those are the things that are frustrating for business. There's, you would, things that you would do as a matter of course if you're running a commercial organisation. And, you know, UK PLC is a commercial organisation. Of course. With a social conscious thrown in. That's a really interesting way of looking at it, actually. Well, we've got... We got we got a sort of a responsibility, a corporate social responsibility. UK PLC has got a corporate social responsibility, but it's a commercial organisation. Mm. That's what we do. We grow our economy. We do better. We make more money. We have a better lifestyle. We have better houses, better cars, better standard of living. And do you think the current system is moving us away from that? Well, I don't know what the present lot doing to be honest with you after four weeks in power I mean to cause that much grief in four weeks is a hell of an achievement <laughs> for anybody um, I certainly wouldn't have bet that that would happen from a from a, a government Tory if, if Jeremy Corbyn had, if, if I had if Jeremy Corbyn had got in with some of his policies then, then I can understand why would, we would have been in the poo at that time but that didn't happen. So a strange situation. Uh, but saying all that, I'm confident and sure that common sense will prevail because the market, as you saw, did not allow the government to get away with this ridiculous posturing and sort of credit card economics that didn't make sense. Mm. And they're having to roll back. It's just how much credibility has been lost. On that, I've been biting this side, so I'll go over there. Hi, uh, so I have to start with admission. Uh, I first became aware of you through uh, Paul Whitehouse's impersonation.
in the sketch curve. It's lovely, isn't it? Harry and Paul. Oh, I, was I was wondering if you were aware of it, and uh, if you were, uh, what's it like being a public figure who's so viciously caricatured and impersonated? Uh, well, I, I've got to be honest with you. I, I think I've met him quite a few times, and, and I think he's a, he's, a, he's a great guy. And um, it's flattering. I have no issue with it at all. Go to the front here. My plaid shirt. Um, with your experience in like, the retail sector, what do you think is going to be of the kind of the high street sectors? Um, which do you think is going to be the biggest casualty of the cost of living crisis, like food, uh, clothing, hospitality? Well, we're seeing that f food is a food. I think is the least, um, but certainly some of the some of the food, uh, re supermarkets will struggle because it's going to be highly competitive. Uh, we're already seeing casualties. There's a lot of casualties on life support. A lot of retail businesses on life support at the moment that undoubtedly will end up as casualties. Um, we saw uh, Saudi One floated for five or six hundred million 12, 12 weeks ago. They're worth nothing now. Tw 12 months ago, rather. I'm losing the plot here. It must be that glass of wine again. Um, 12 months ago. They're, they're worth practically nothing now. So there's going to be quite a few um, that are on life support are only worth a fraction of what they are. And it's not because they're just crap businesses. I think with COVID and what's happened and the cost of living, which is definitely affecting consumers. And I can tell you, we got talked about Robert Dyers earlier. Um, last week was it not was a good, good week for Robert Dyers. It was a very, very good. It's a night as we don't know Robert Dyers. It's a night, it's a household arm mongery shop. There's about a hundred of them, mainly in the south. But the number one bestseller was a, an air fryer. Other bestsellers, electric blankets. Other bestsellers, electric uh, air dryers. This is all to do with the cost of living. So an air fryer, you can put on... When you, when you, I'll go back. An air fryer is very simple. It says exactly what it says. It's not putting your oven on. You put something in the air fryer and it will cook it very quickly. But an oven takes 20 minutes to warm up before you can put your fish and chips in. Mm -hmm. So you're spending all that time heating an empty oven. Very expensive. An air fryer gets quick, very, very quickly. And you can cook fish and chips in about 12 to 15 minutes. So for a family looking at their power costs, they're not going to keep an oven on for half an hour before they can put the fish and chips in to cook for the kids. An air, uh, uh, an air dryer, uh, an air dryer, it's basically a clothes horse that you can open up, that you plug in, and gets warm, and you put your clothes on to dry, and still put them in a tumble dryer. They're not, not quite as fluffy, but they'll dry reasonably quickly on a heated air dryer um, for a fraction of the cost of a tumble dryer. So all these things people are actually bracing themselves for and looking at what's happening, what's going to happen. And I think we're going to see more and more and more of this over the next uh, few months and certainly till the war and even after the next election because we don't know what's going to happen with the war. So not, not great things to look forward to. We talked about a bit, but is the high street dying or do you think it's a staple that will always sort of survive? Well, it will be there, but it's, it's how it's there. But it, it, has, it has been dying and, and again, successive governments have been too cowardly to deal with business rates. And this was a wonderful opportunity for the Tories because to deal with business rates today, which is something that everybody's been crying out for, that would have been a battle that Liz Trust could have won and could have got backing for. Um, and also, by the way, would have been a rounding error in the amount of money that they need to spend. Mm. And I think that would have revitalised our high streets even more but I'll give you an example. Of my, as I, you pay rent if you, for your stores and you pay business rates. Business rates are meant to be 40p in the pound of what your rent is. But actually, my r rates to rent bill as a group is 80%, not 40%. Because rents have come down. Have they? Yes. 
How's that? Because that's commercial negotiation, so called supply and demand. You all know about that, those the economics. Supply and demand. If people don't want to take the shop, the landlord puts his rent down. Of course. So just to sell it, so, uh, to rent it. But rates don't move. So I've got so many shops where my rates are the same as my rent. Now, a lot of people go out of business doing that. And there's empty shops because nobody can afford to pay, even if you give it to somebody for free and say no rent, the rates are too expensive. So that doesn't make sense. So would you cut that completely? I would. We still need revenue. You know, we've still got to pay for our social services, our debt. So the answer is I would repurpose it. And I would reorganize a way where there was still some contribution, but nowhere near like that. But I would also look at collecting taxes for online players that actually don't pay much business rates. They don't pay a lot of other things. They don't pay corporation tax. They claim to pay, but it's nominal. So I would find a way of creating more revenue, not less. But I definitely this. would. I'd rebalance. That's really interesting as a view. Any more? Just one there. Are you a first hand or? Just get a mic to you. Uh, hi. Can I just say, first of all, it's really refreshing to see someone who's just so down to earth um, and just speaks their mind about things. Um, my question was obviously, we've gone on to pursue higher education, whereas you had the experience of dropping out. Um, of school at 16. It wasn't by choice. Not by choice, of course. <laughs> I but wish I could have gone and done further education. But as a result of that, you've, you've gone on to have probably quite a different experience than we've had in our lives. Do you think there's any important lessons from that period of your life as a result of not being able to pursue higher education that you think could benefit us or we could learn about that we haven't as a result of going through the traditional route of education? No. I went to the University of Hard Knocks and screwing up and learning from it, right? That's bloody painful. So I would rather have gone to university if I could have got any university to take me on at the time. It's a lot easier now, and I know many, many dyslexic kids go to university and really do well because we're structured differently. But of course, I would have loved to have gone and learned without the pain and learned better. For instance, 50% of all small businesses fail in the first two years of startups. That's a staggering statistic. So they fail. Now imagine if we, and, and bear in mind half of our economy is based on small businesses, if we didn't have that failure rate, imagine what would happen to our economy. How much growth we'd have. And through education, we can do that through educating the next entrepreneurs and the next business leaders, that they can go into business and not fail because they've had a good education and a good understanding of business and commerce, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I think that would have been of a great benefit to me. Um, I, that doesn't mean I haven't, I've learned, and I've been fortunate to learn and not get, not get run over on the way. But not everybody does. People get run over, disheartened, mm. lose enthusiasm. But of those 50%, by the way, um, that fell in the first two years, <coughs> the interesting thing is a, a good proportion go on to do something else afterwards and are successful because they've learned. But what a painful way to learn. So education, higher education, business education, uh, it, it, do not underestimate the value <coughs> you get. I've, I've heard lots of people say, oh, I'm a self-starter, I didn't go to university, I've done it all on my own and this and that, but it just doesn't tell you how, you know, how they did it and why they did it and what, how it worked. But I know that vast, for a vast majority of people, that's not the way. Mm. And for the economy, it's not the way. The economy is, we want well-educated, knowledgeable people starting businesses and going into commerce with success at their fingertips. And that's what's going to give us growth. 
I'm conscious we're short on time, but this is brilliant, so I'm hoping we can just run a bit over if that's all right. I think we'll have two more questions. So if you've got one, ask now. You were a very fast hand, so I'll go over there. Hello. Um, thank you very much for coming. Please excuse my lost voice. Um, what, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs or aspiring business owners? Is um, now a good time, given the economic situation? And how do you think that might change in the next few years? Well, the first question is what I said I couldn't do before, give binary answers to. I actually can on this one. There's always a good time. Right? So, when there's crap going on, there's disruption. When there's disruption, there's opportunity. Right? So, there's always opportunity. There's always a niche, an area. So, there's never a bad time. It's just, you've got to do it slightly differently, identify the sectors and everything else. So you've got to understand which sector you're going into, and is it a good time for that sector? So the, the answer is, if you think you, that's what you want to do, just do your bloody homework. Understand the sector you're going into. What was the other question? Kind of, how do you think the kind of condition of the UK is going to change in the next few years? and how that will affect entrepreneurs and business owners? Well, I don't know, I haven't got a crystal ball. I couldn't have told you what was going to happen four weeks ago. <laughs> you know, quasi kamikaze, as I call in him. I mean, it's proper kamikaze stuff. And the thought of any idiot could have told him what was going to happen. And he's not an idiot. He's academically brilliant. I don't know if you know, but he academically, he's, he's absolutely very sharp, very brilliant. So I'm not even open the jar of works and take the lid off. Um, and the practicalities. And there was an arrogance, hubris that existed in that speech, sadly. Mm -hmm. And as existed with the current Prime Minister. I mean, I'm hoping this has knocked it out of them. And then they say, shit, that's not how it works. Right, regroup. <laughs> Let's play the market, not hanks against the market. And play them. So... I, I don't know, but I've, have I got confidence in the UK? Of course I have. And uh, this is still a great country, a great place to be. And it's, it, it's local difficulties, as they call it, temporary difficulties. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll get over them and common sense will prevail. I'm more worried about the war, to be honest with you, in Ukraine than I'm worried about uh, uh, Liz Truss and Quasi getting a slapping and getting back in line. Right, who's the next one? As it's the final question, do you want to choose? It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, you got two, so we'll do both of them and then we'll kill it. Right, Blue, who's your top? Hi. Um, I'm actually interested in uh, the largest investment that you made in the den. So I think it was a quarter of a million pounds for a company called Zappa. Um, I was just interested in whether or not they were able to become dominant in the market given competitors like Music Magpie. And sort of off the back of that, is there an excitement that comes with being head-to-head -head with other companies trying to push something to market, or is it just completely no? Well, I don't even remember that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I made an investment in it. Uh, if, we, if there was an offer, it didn't go through. The problem you had with some of the... Once people realised what Dragon's Den was all about, there was a slight change, and we had to change our tack. People used to go on for publicity and get an investment and then say, nah, I'm not doing that. You know, it's, we'll give you half. And then you'd have to tell them to get lost. But they waited until the show went on. I can't remember if that was one of those. But then we, we got wise to that after a while and made sure that when we spotted that. So when you, if you think we were being unfair to some, it's because they weren't there for the real deal. So they, de they deserved a good old slap. To get, to get them on their toes and say it's going to be tough. Well, because it's going to be tough out there. So you might as well learn it in here. You're not going to get an investment. You're not here for an investment anyway. You're trying to get some publicity. That's fine. But there's a price for everything. So I, that, that one didn't go through. And the second part of that question was... Uh, whether there's some excitement to be head-to-head with other companies. Oh, bloody hell, is it? Yes. I mean, it, it's, honestly, it's, uh, the highs and lows of business are great. Those of you 
that have ever, and I'm sure nobody in this room has ever tried illegal substances of any form. Um, but, and I haven't. I can honestly tell you, hand on heart, I haven't. Um, so I, I hear what it's meant to be like. But it's nonsense. Highs and lows. Get involved in football. You get some bloody highs and lows there. Uh, get involved in business. There'll be some highs and lows and excitement. You know, so you'll get all that. Uh, so there is, and it's, it's very, very exciting when you do uh, start competing with specific sectors and getting to know that sector. And it becomes you know, a game of chess. Right, that was the last question. The gentleman at the back, also in blue but dark blue jacket. Yep. Hi. So, uh, with your economic expertise and having heard... Hold on, I've got a no level, basically. <laughs> Well, just one. The job experts. And it was actually, it's not a proper O level, it's a Scottish certificate in colouring in maps. I couldn't sit, <laughs> I couldn't, it was the equivalent of an O level. I couldn't sit that board, because that board only did O levels, and I didn't qualify, so I had to do, and that was geography. But I was really good at colouring in between the map, in the lines, <laughs> I was really good at that. Yeah, I'll rephrase, with your business expertise <laughs> and your well, vocal political views that you've expressed here and online. Do you ever see yourself getting into politics? Don't be ridiculous. If not, if not, why? Uh, so the last bit? If not, why? Uh, well, very simple. First of all, I'm far too old, got too much baggage, and I've, I've just, you've just heard me. <laughs> For fuck's sake. <laughs> Can you imagine when I go off like that and to politicians? Because they all want to court you and all sorts of things, and, you know, try and get to know you and, and put carrots under your nose. And you go off under one of those rants which points out the bloody obvious to them. But of course, that's not their, cri that's not their focus. That's not their path. Their path is a career path. Their path is, not, to begin with, is, I mean, forget whatever they say to you, 90% of the decisions they make early on in their career, or, or certainly for most of their career, will be career path-led. Not what is particularly the right thing to do for the medium term, long term, or for the country. And nobody likes to hear that in politics. And I've had a God knows how many debates and rows over that. But I'm happy to use examples, do whatever you like, at any stage in time. So, you know, there's a, there's a certain person that can be in politics. And some, by the way, have done that early on in their career. And then the penny has dropped. I must put the light bulb on. And they've actually, we should be very proud of them. Because they've taken principled views that without which this country would be not as rich as a country. And some of them have sacrificed careers, by the way, in doing so. Sacrificed promising careers. Some have done it in a different way where they've not done it quite as overtly, blatantly, but managed to stay and change things from the inside. So there is, there is really uh, some good people that do it for the right reason eventually. But it starts off quite career, career personal career development. And that, that doesn't work for me. And no one's asked me who I vote for, who I'd vote for. Does anybody have a clue listening to me? Well, you spoke about old-fashioned conservative views, but we haven't had those in a long time, so it's hard to say. <laughs> I don't want to guess and be wrong. No, but, that's, no but, but you have to be wrong in life. We talked about that earlier. I would guess you voted for Boris, I think, if I had to. But you would be so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, not because the party he represents, but he has a disconnect mm. with the truth. Um, <laughs> and that's never a good thing, right? I know politicians get slated, and I do it more than anybody else, about it this being disingenuous. But there's a big difference between being disingenuous and just blatantly lying, knowing false well, there's a piece of paper that says something totally there. I mean, there's a big difference in not answering a question 
as we had this trust this morning doing, and just plainly tell you what you want to hear. Irrespective that you know it's a damn right lie. And, no, and a different ver- there's no such thing as a different version of the truth. Or what is it? An alternate fact. <laughs> it's an alternative fact. It's a bleeding lie. Yeah. Um, so yes, so it's difficult. And, and I don't have a part, the answer is I don't have a party allegiance. Mm. Uh, I'd like to, irrespective of my position in life, or, uh, where I am today, where I started from, all pays an influence. And I like to think I'm balanced. And I would vote, quite happily vote for a Labour Party I thought would do, was right for the country. And I would quite happily vote for a Tory uh, government that I thought was right for, a con- for the country. And I would even possibly vote for a Liberal. <laughs> um, but, 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 but proportional representation will eventually come. Is that a good thing? I think so. I think so, because this, we've got this five-year nonsense, which means that people can't really... They're, they're frightened to do anything for the medium term and the long term, because they're not going to get the benefit. They could cause a lot of aggravation and get ousted. Mm. And that might just give you the ability to have a more sustained period of government that could do, take a better long-term view. I think short-term is a big problem in the, in the current government and how fast things change. Yeah, yeah. So that's the reason. So I can come here, say whatever I like. And I, and you know, I don't care monkeys. I can, I can, and, and, and if there's some politicians here, we could have a right old ding-dong. <laughs> and they could be trying to defend the indefensible. And you can really enjoy yourself if you can take that view. But you couldn't if you were a party member or had to toe the line and, and you know, follow a party. It is a shame, though, because we could do some common sense politics. That would be... We improvement on the current situation. Theo, this has been brilliant. I've been so interested for the last hour. I've let this overrun quite a lot, so I'm sorry about that, but it's just been far too interesting to cut off. Um, could you all join me in thanking Theo for coming and talking to us? It's been brilliant. Thank you.